If you're an American, you know Thanksgiving is a time to eat. So I hope you brought your appetite because I prepared a real feast for this special occasion. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling John Gulliger's beloved splatter flick, Feast. Released in 2005, Feast garnered a lot of attention because it was the focus of the third season of Project Greenlight. Previously on Project Greenlight. This time we wanted to make a genre movie, so we brought in a master of genre movies, Dimension. The reality show format changed over the four seasons, but for this outing they picked a script from new screenwriters and then paired it with a first-time director. Feast was the end result. Now it's up to Marcus, Patrick, and John to make a terrific movie. But enough about that. Can Feast fill your gullet with a smorgasbord of splatter? Let's get to the gore and find out. Oh, and before we get started, today's video is sponsored by patrons David J. Thompson, Joe Relihan, and Super Mickey Chow. Sorry if I butchered anyone's name. If you'd like to sponsor some videos, you'll find a link to my Patreon in the pinned comment in the description below. And now, let's get bloody. To mention films, great, is Busta Rhymes gonna ruin this movie too? We fade in on someone's home movies? I guess it's cool they at least put a title card on it. I'm really gonna have to sit closer to the screen if the movie is this small. And jump cut to a car crash. Usually the movies I watch wait until the third act to crash and burn. I will say that I like the Feast isn't wasting any time here. Then we stop by the bar, where we get our first taste of Feast's weird penchant for introducing its characters with cards. I'm guessing this will not only be useful for keeping everyone straight, but also for wagering purposes since it provides odds of survival. And now we're meeting another character. This isn't so much a movie as it is a meet and greet at this point. And here's another. This was kind of a cool conceit, but cramming three of them into 30 seconds might be overkill. But hey, we're not done. Here's Coach, aka Henry Rollins. Alright, I'm starting to wonder if this whole movie is going to be these cards. This is the equivalent of a PowerPoint of Hi, My Name Is stickers at this point. Hope you didn't think we were done, because here's Jason Mewes. I guess they couldn't afford Silent Bob. He could have probably helped this script. I thought the fat one didn't really talk that much. Next up, Judah Friedlander. I hope he plays the jaded hipster he plays in every other movie he's in. This really is like a weird time capsule of people who were celebs in 2005. Okay, so maybe that time capsule goes back further than 2005, because here's Clue Gulliger. Fun fact, Feast director John Gulliger is his son. Honestly, I'm starting to feel like the opening of Feast is the setup for some elaborate joke about hipsters in a bar. And here's Tuffy, aka Krista Allen. This is already the weirdest episode of Emmanuel in Space ever. If you thought we were done, guess again. Here's Naughty by Nature's Tretch. No, really, that's him. Maybe he and Rollins can do an OPP duet later. Fingers crossed. That has to be the last one, right? <laughs> Not so fast. Here's Boss Man. You can just look at this dude and smell the stale Funyuns and B.O. right through your screen. Oh my god, enough already movie. Feast is hell bent on running this gag straight into the ground. I feel like next we'll start introducing the film crew with these cards too. This movie isn't even 90 minutes long and I've spent 10 on introductions. Back in the movie, Billy Reed here is busy fantasizing about Bo Brady. Whiskey shooter, please. That's a deep cut Days of Our Lives joke, if you were wondering. Oh look, it's Dwayne Whitaker from Hobgoblins. He's appeared in at least 800 other movies, but who cares? It's Road Rash. Over at the pool table, Jay's having trouble working his stick. Hell yeah. <laughs> no, not like that, you pervs. I mean, he scratches on this shot. What the fuck? Oh! After work, Emmanuel spends time with her kid. I think CPS is probably going to object to them sharing a beer. And surprise, we're not done with those cards yet. War and Peace wishes it had this many characters. Come on, take you to your car. Not tonight. I have an escort. Back at the bar, Henry's about to seal the deal, but then this happens. Hey, he told you he was a liar. He even sang a song about it. Cause I'm a liar! In the back, Judah Friedlander is doing a little tap dance as he moves these kegs. Damn, baby. Act like you feel it. Ah! Damn, this really is like the grubbiest Emmanuel in Space episode ever. Back outside, the Evil Dead are closing in. Join us. This is what happens when you read the Necronomicon on the can. Inside the bar, Budget Brian Austin Green is testing out his best pickup lines. Hey, I heard your bike is in the shop. How about you ride me instead? All of this excitement is interrupted by, you guessed it, another character card. 
Hero, that's pretty imaginative. He's here to deliver some exposition right to your door. A storm of hell's coming down on this place any second. These fuckers are fast, nasty, and hungry. Hmm, a bunch of people barricading a bar against an outside force. Didn't I already do VFW? And after more jibber jabber, this happens. I'm the guy that's gonna save your ass. I like this better when it happened in Deep Blue Sea, if we're being honest. Dretch is the next to get it, suffering a fate that feels like it would have been right at home in a Mortal Kombat game. Kano wins. Some baby mutant is running amok inside, and Harley Mama here isn't gonna have a leg to stand on once it's done. And the carnage doesn't stop there. Jay shows us his favorite John Woo cosplay. I call this face off. After they capture the baby creature, things get back to normal with another character card. Bear me. All right, that has to be the last one, right? With the excitement over, Boss Man comes down looking for who shot him in the foot. Where is the son of a bitch? He's dead. Awkward. Krista Allen conveniently remembers that she has a kid and runs upstairs to find him. If you guessed he was fine, oh, wait. I guess Krista Allen just lost her child tax credit. Then Judah Friedlander does his best Peter Venkman impression. He slimed me. This is really starting to look like one of those weird Japanese fetish videos. But hey, they can call for help, right? What about cell phones? This is canyon country, honey. It ain't gonna happen. No, you could say things are really going down the drain at this point of the movie. Judah's ready to call it a night, but our heroine isn't letting him leave without settling his bar tab and gives him a taste of her pimp hand. And after she's done beating him, she delivers some more exposition. My daughter is out there waiting for me. I have just as much reason to get out of this place as you do. When that's over, Budget Brian Austin Green finds himself a jump scare. Oh, shit. And now it's time for a montage. Maybe they're just barricading themselves from the plot. I gotta say, I haven't seen a place this boarded up since my last visit to Detroit. Over here, Krista Allen is thinking deep thoughts. If Cinderella's shoe fit perfectly, why did it fall off? Back at the bar, Boss Man's shooting the cooler. You could say he's a cold-hearted killer. Too bad he's a lousy shot and the monster is about to give him a vasectomy. God bless guns. Krista Allen saves the day by summoning her inner ash and giving the creature a taste of her boomstick. So they were basically getting their ass kicked by a rotisserie chicken. This is probably bad, but don't worry. Motivational speaker Tony Rollins here has a plan. We just need to show them that we are not vulnerable, that we are formidable. This is probably what he told the band right before they went on stage at Woodstock 94. Oh look, it's Bran from Game of Thrones. And how will they do this? How? If you guess by tossing the dead baby creature's carcass outside, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. The scent of their dead may drive them back. I mean, what could go wrong? I'm sure that's gonna work out great. It's a goddamn family. We just killed their baby. Yeah, thanks, movie. We already figured that out. I mean, Brant basically cheated. Three-Eyed Raven showed him all of this. Outside, things are going from bad to worse. These things reproduce faster than tribbles. And now we slow things down for some exposition. We dropped our daughter off at my mom's house. And suddenly, uh, we hit it. Its head was in the road. Um, why do her memories look like they're rerunning on a UHF channel? You kids even remember UHF channels? Christ, I'm old. Story time is interrupted by Judah Friedlander, who's going through some changes. The fuck is this shit? He's basically turning into Danzig at this point. Oh, you guys don't fucking care about me! I don't care. Go suffer somewhere else. Whatever's going on, it's really gotten under his skin. Literally. Just like a Frank Sinatra song. You kids better remember old Blue Eyes. Speaking of Blue Eyes, Judah here is about to have an eye-opening experience. And yeah, old Prude Tube's not gonna let me show you the monster ripping his eye out. But trust me, it's pretty biblical. Then another monster steals Henry Rowland's pants. Whenever he paid for these things, it was a total rip-off. Chris Allen, meanwhile, is thinking more deep thoughts. What happens if I get scared half to death twice? Judah's passed out on the pool table. You can definitely stick a fork in him. After even more jibber-jabber, they split up for a supply run. Brian Austin Green and the fellas make a run for the peach pit, while the ladies head for the basement. Upstairs, budget Brian Austin Green explores the closet, but not even R. Kelly is in there. That's because he's going to prison. But he does find this jump scare. <laughs> he's clearly having a real bat time up here. Eventually, he does manage to get to this radio. I'm a call for help, but first I gotta spit these 16 bars. 
I was kinda hesitant Cause I wasn't sure if super masculine Was the way I was to represent The creatures aren't fans So he's dashing out of there Even faster than he did on the night Donna Martin told him She wanted to stay a virgin until marriage <laughs> Bet you didn't think the horror geek Knew about 90210, did ya? Too bad for him, the key breaks in the lock. But luckily, Jill Valentine is here to save the day. Rollins takes this break in the action to practice some of his latest demotivational speeches. What have we learned so far? Trying is the first step on the road to failure. So never try. His speech is interrupted when the monsters start breaking down the walls like they're Chris Jericho. Break the wall down! I think everyone's just being attacked by jump cuts. I need Dramamine to get through this movie. Oh hey, remember Judah Friedlander? Yeah, it turns out he's still in this movie, and not dead after all. Hey, what about the basement hatch door? After even more jibber-jabber, man, Feast is pretty chatty for a monster movie, they hatch a plan to escape. You gonna climb through that hatch down there? If you thought those dead bodies in the basement were Chekhov's corpses, well, that's another screenwriter's credit for you. You really could say they're about to get a leg up on these monsters. Jack! Oh! Honey Pie gets a good look at Judah Friedlander, and really, this is a pretty common reaction. Then Brian Austin Green shows us why he's a black belt in bear trap foo. You could say he's a trap rapper now. For a chick named Harley Mama, this lady is a real drag. They take her up to what looks like Dexter's kill room, but surprise, she's not dead. Holy shit! She's alive. <laughs> this would seem to present a problem, but Boss Man proves you don't get to be boss without developing problem-solving skills. Come on, grab it, you dumbass, grab it! The monsters grab Mama, and after some fumbling around, things get pretty explosive. Things then quickly go awry after Boss Man asks Budget Brian Austin Green to give up his rap career. Brian Austin Green and Machine Gun Kelly finally duke it out and settle their feud. <laughs> Our heroine, meanwhile, is trapped outside with the monsters. Back upstairs, we see why Notorious B.A.G.'s gangster rap career never really went anywhere. I mean, he's no iced tea. Plus, he just shot our heroine. And yeah, she's toast. Being a hero in this movie is not all it's cracked up to be. This is great news for Boss Man, though. Now no one will ever know your whiskey dick makes you wet the bed. Downstairs, we get more deep thoughts. When you lose your train of thought, where does it go? This is the real Dark Knight of the Soul moment of Feast, so Grandma's like, screw you guys, I'm getting blitzed. But hey, Krista Allen isn't going down without a fight. Right now, you morose motherfuckers are gonna get off your ass and get ready to roll. And remember those character cards? Yeah, they're still in this movie too. Boss Man's not up for a road trip, but that's okay because the monsters are ready to take him to go. And if you're wondering what happened to Henry Rollins, wonder no more. I always thought of Henry as more of a punk rocker, but dude's a real headbanger. Bullshit! And it basically turns into the weirdest Home Alone ripoff ever. Turns out the last barrel has a prize in it. Start it. Start it! <laughs> Honey Pie makes it to the truck and leaves them all behind? She's leaving us? Not gonna lie, I'd probably have done the same. And then the monsters break in. Say what you will, but these guys definitely know how to make an entrance. And we get our first good look at the creature. Kinda looks like a naked Venom. Or Pumpkinhead. Someone get Lance Henriksen over here. In the ensuing Donnybrook, this monster gets caught in the trap. I bet that's unbearably painful. Then Judah Freelander gets his head crushed like that scene from Story of Ricky. And no, there's no way I can show you that without getting demonetized. Trust me though, there's a good amount of gore in Feast. The fellas then wrestle this monster to the ground, but Krista Allen decides to butt in. Man, she's hammering that thing like she's Hank Aaron. While she's beating this thing like it owes her money, Clue Gulliger has a heart attack and gets his throat ripped out. I guess you could say this monster finally got a clue. Then Krista decides to feed it a knuckle sandwich. Choke on it! I feel like she has definitely seen Just Before Dawn. With the creature dead, it basically turns into a Beatles song. Self feels a lot like the end of From Dusk Till Dawn, if we're being honest. I mean, except budget Brian Austin Green is no George Clooney. Then they ride off into the sunset in search of more adventure. Or not. I mean, I guess this movie was bound to stall out at some point. Oh wait, there it goes driving right into the credits. If you're wondering what happened to Grandma, well, wonder no more. She got left behind, but she's definitely not alone. 
Revisiting Feast as it closes in on its 20th anniversary is a sort of odd experience. This film is definitely splattery, but like so many of the films of the early 2000s, it's aged in a really weird way. Feast doesn't look so much dated as it does a product of its era. The cast screams 2005 B-movie and the look and editing feel very tied to that time period as well. The franchise spawned three films and then it was over just as suddenly as it started. Director John Gulliger went on to direct Piranha Triple D and a Children of the Corn sequel, but he probably really should have had a bigger career. His Project Greenlight cohorts, screenwriters Marcus Dunstan and Patrick Melton, had a bit of a better run, writing things like several Saw sequels, The Collector films, and being attached to other big projects. They reunited with Gulliger on that Piranha sequel. But enough about that. Can Fee serve up five barf bags of splatter to go? Let's go to the gore card. In terms of gross anatomy, Feast definitely delivers. We're treated to a ripped out eye, stomped monster junk, eviscerations, a face removal, and that great exploding head. And those are just the highlights. And even though I couldn't show you 95% of the splatter, believe me when I tell you there's more than enough gore here to justify giving Feast a full five barf bag rating. This is definitely a sick flick. Looking for another splattery movie where people are trapped in a location by monsters? Then be sure to check out my review of The Evil Dead. You'll find a link here on the screen after my outtakes. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters. <laughs> If you're an American, you know Thanksgiving is a time to eat. So I hope you wrote your... Bleh. It's always good when I screw up the first line. Suffering a fate that feels like it... Ooh, voice crack. Krista Allen saves the day by summoning her inner ash. That was the teleprompter's fault, not mine. Just an effortlessly performed recording today. Holy hell, that was a disaster.